could be 25, but we'll keep it brief. Anyway, who knows who Paul Revere was? That's right. And a lot of you, in the old days, they, they in New England, they'd make you memorize a poem by Henry Wadsworth. Longfellow. Oh, very good. Listen, my children, and you shall hear the midnight ride of... Paul Revere. Paul Revere, excellent. Now, funny thing, Paul Revere was not the only one to make that midnight ride because they wanted to make sure that somebody got through. Other people, you know, you're out there, you're trying to warn that the regulars are out. They didn't say... The British. They did not say... The British. The British, the British are coming. Why? Because at that time we were all British. We were British colonists. That wouldn't make any sense. They were regular troops, regular army, so they said, the regulars are out, the regulars are out, the regulars are out. One of the other riders was William Dawes. Now, if you're going to write a poem, what sounds better? Dawes or Revere? Revere. Yeah, it flows off the tongue a little better. So somebody wrote a poem about William Dawes. Just in, uh, the end of the poem goes something like this. They don't remember me because his name's Revere and my name's Dawes. Midnight ride and William Dawes. He got there about a minute after in Lexington, about one minute after Paul Revere. Here comes this other horse. Whoops, I just missed my, my chance at, uh, at fame in the United States history books. Um, there was another writer named Prescott. And uh, anyway, Paul Revere was um, part of what Mr. McGonagall talked about, a whole militia system. Now, we're going to go out to uh, something that happened later. I mean, the next day, there were battles at Lexington and Concord because there had been posturing now for five years, but the militia system had been around for about 150 years, since the beginning of the colonies. So it wasn't just a bunch of farmers that said, God, I'm tired of the British, look at their neighbors and say, yeah, let's all get guns and just kick them out of here. You know, some people think that happened. Absolutely not. They were a very well-organized militia. A well-organized militia. Uh, what starts with those words? A well-organized militia system. being being what? Yes. A well-organized militia being necessary. Now, is there any other time in our Constitution where you hear the word necessary? No. That's right. They thought it was pretty important to have this system in place because that's how we beat the British. Because they were well-organized. They were organized by their towns. They had captains. And um, there were basically two different types. Um, there was the, the, the old regular militia that had been around for 150 years. And then when it looked like things were going to get, you know, really, uh, we could go to war, they developed these young, they get guys like you, the young guys that were really crack, really in shape, and, uh, you know, maybe a little bit brave or maybe a little bit too brave, but would be right out there on the vanguard, and they could be there at a moment's notice. What were they called? Minutemen. Minutemen, that's right. So uh, I was covering for my podcast, I was covering the midnight ride of Paul Revere in Lexington. It's getting to be about uh, midnight, and it's a lot of fun. If you live in Massachusetts, um, it's almost like kind of like a second Halloween uh, in that it's at night. It's uh, kids out with, the, with their friends in Lexington. Uh, Pastor Lear, who grew up in Lexington, remembers that. Probably Mr. Perloff. Is he still here? He just left. Okay, he grew up in Lexington. It's something that all the, the Lexingtonian kids know about. You stay up and you watch Paul Revere come riding up the night before. And then the next day they have the reenactment on the green, the reenactment of the battle. And the, the captain of that, that wasn't a minute company at Lexington, by the way. There's, there's a minute man on Lexington Green, but that was a regular company of militia, not a minute company. And uh, the leader uh, was called Reverend, I mean, I'm sorry, Captain Parker, Captain John Parker. And you are a direct descendant from the, 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 the original Captain John Parker. He's my grandfather. Oh, he's many, many, many greats, your grandfather. Maybe even he's my ten. My seventh great grandfather. Yes. Yeah. You know. So that's uh, if you add your your, your 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 parents in there, that's eight, nine generations. Unbelievable. Pastor Lear is also a direct descendant of that battle. 
So anyway, um, these couriers were warning that. Now, what were they going out that night? What were the, the, the British interested in? They were interested in two things, basically. And what were they? What's one of the things they wanted to get? Yes? Um, wait, which one were we playing? Uh, the Descendant. Ammunition? <laughs> what? Ammunition. Ammunition. Ammunition goes, what does the ammunition go inside? A gun. A gun, yes. Fire. That's right. They were coming to take guns. What is another word for gun? When you're talking about individuals with guns, you're talking about like rifles and stuff. But when you're talking about war and you use the term gun, what do you really mean? Munitions. What kind of guns? Cannons. Cannon. Very good. When, you, when you're talking about a war and you talk about the guns, you're usually talking about field pieces, artillery, or cannon. And those were stored at Concord. Now, what was else at, at Concord? That was the sort of headquarters or capital of Massachusetts at the time because the British had moved into Boston. So that's where the colonial legislature was meeting at Concord. So they were going to come into Concord, take the guns, and they were also interested in taking two patriots. Not killing them, but taking them alive. Who were those two patriots they were coming out to arrest that night that Paul Revere made a point to go directly to the house where they, they were staying? Who were they? Yes. John Adams and Sam Adams. John Adams and Sam Adams. Close. Uh, Sam Adams they were coming after. There was another one they were coming after. He was a very rich merchant, and when it came time to declare independence, he was the president of the Continental Congress in 1776. And just to make sure that King George could read his John signature Man. without his spectacles, John he wrote Hancock. his signature very big. Who was it? John, John Hancock. Hancock. John Hancock. That's right. If you ever go see a Red Sox game, you'll see his name in big neon because it's the name of a life insurance company now. Anyway, so... John Hancock was sleeping in the home of Reverend Jonas, um, oh, why is this slipping my name? Uh, help me out here, Hal. Emerson? No, in, in Lexington. Clark. Clark. Clark, Clark, yes, Reverend Clark, and he was engaged to Reverend, Reverend Clark's daughter. So they were sleeping in different bedrooms, and so Paul Revere comes riding up and says, uh, the regulars are out, the regulars are out. And uh, the, the reverend comes to the to the to the window or the door and says, "Shh, you're gonna you're gonna wake you're gonna wake the ladies up. Just be a little, you know." He says, "Everybody's gonna be awake in a few hours. The regulars are out." And uh, they reenact this every year. And uh, Paul Revere would wake them up and shake them shake them up. And we in this camp were all like Paul Revere because we're trying to wake people up to the importance of the Constitution, you know. And it's our job to do that because it's not being taught as it once was. What I was saying, the song we sing about the, the Constitution during the bicentennial years when a lot of us were going up, every Saturday they would play that on television, you know, and they would play all these other songs teaching us about, you know, how, how our government worked, all the things we learned here. Uh, they thought that was a good idea, and it is a good idea. Now they're not doing it anymore, so you and I must be the Paul Revere's. Now, before Paul Revere made that ride, can anybody say what his job was? Yes. He was a silversmith. Now this is sort of funny, he was actually a goldsmith. This is sort of funny, he <laughs> primarily dealt with silver, so silversmith is correct, but if you did any smithing at all with gold, they called you a goldsmith. That was sort of like trumped the silver part of it, but he mostly dealt in silver, he was a very, very fine silversmith. Some of his pieces, um, including, now this is sort of interesting, the, and I don't approve of this, but uh, the colonial generation, the men that fought, they liked refreshment. Does anybody know what they meant when they said refreshment? Beer. 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 Rock. So one of Paul Revere's, what they call a tankard, in, in, in the Museum of Fine Arts, it's about that big. It would probably hold at least a gallon of beer. So. I was like, as a historian, I was like, you know, talking to the museum people, did they really, yes, they could drink a gallon of beer at a time, and does anybody know what Patriot was also a brewer? Sam Adams. Sam Adams, yeah, so maybe the British just wanted to arrest him and just have him as their own private brewer for the war to brew the beer. No, they didn't. 
<laughs> Anyways, okay, so, Paul Revere, he was uh, from French Huguenot ancestry, not astronauts, Huguenots. Anybody know what a Huguenot is? They were French uh, Protestants who were uh, persecuted in France. A lot of people came to this country um, because they were being persecuted for one reason or another. And that's what Paul Revere is. I think his real name was Apollonius Revoir or something. And uh, he wanted to sound American, so it was changed to Revere. And he was a great American. He has a great biography because one-third of his life was spent as a colonial, about one-third during the Revolutionary and Constitutional period, and then one-third in the Young Republic phase. So he also made several other rides that are not so famous because the war didn't start that night. Once he came up here to New Hampshire, and uh, my line will have a couple of ancestors that fought, as yours did. Uh, one of them was up here in New Hampshire, and these folks were Scots-Irish, and it's sort of funny. When the Battle of Bunker Hill happened, um, John Adams said we were one-third timid, um, we were one-third Tory, and we were one-third true blue. True blue. So not everybody was on the side of, uh, you know, not everybody really wanted to go to war. Most people didn't. In the, in the early phase, it wasn't even a third. It was maybe even as low as 3% if you went all, all across the colonies. But in England, that was probably a good makeup. Up here in New Hampshire, they were Scots-Irish. They had historic uh, disagreements. And you didn't really have to wonder which side your neighbor was on. Um, when Johnny Stark, the one that said live free or die, said, let's go. We're going to Bunker Hill at every man. Grabbed a gun, went down there. Uh, there were more men at, at that time. New Hampshire, as today, had only about one fifth the population, a fourth to a fifth the population of, of Massachusetts, maybe only less than half of that of Connecticut. And yet, there were more New Hampshire men on uh, Bunker Hill than there were in Massachusetts and Connecticut combined. There were over a thousand men, uh, so they were pretty brave. I always like to put in a good word for New Hampshire. Who's from New Hampshire this morning? Anybody? Yes, and what's your motto? Live free or die. Live free or die, absolutely. Who said that? Me. <laughs> oh, oh. General, General John Stark. Stark, that's right. So anyway, when the Battle of Bunker Hill came, they stopped by the, the first place that the, the Lexington, I mean, the, the New Hampshire men stopped by was Lexington. They heard about that. They heard about what happened. And they wanted to make sure they were okay. But Paul Revere, before that ever happened, like the winter before, he came up to here, uh, to New Hampshire, and said, look, guys, there's a fight brewing. Uh, we're going to need some ammunition. Uh, and guess where the ammunition was stored here in New Hampshire? Anybody? Fort, out in Portsmouth. Fort William and, William and, who was his wife? William and Mary. Fort William and Mary. So uh, it could have been a war right there, but what happened was these New Hampshire guys showed up in force and they said, uh, hand over your powder. We're going to need that before long. And they said they were greatly outnumbered. They said, here you go, guys. You're welcome to it. And that powder was used at Bunker Hill, and they also got some, uh, some guns. And the guns I'm talking about were really? Cannons. Cannons, yep. Use those. And uh, so that was basically a lot of what happened. Uh, on that day, by the way, Paul Revere, after that night, after he, he was done with Lexington, he warned Hancock and Hancock and Sam Adam. Adam, somebody's away. Good. All right, don't be shy, folks. He warned them. Then he's heading out to Concord, where we're going today. He's going to warn some more people. He didn't make it. He got caught and arrested in the town in between the town of Lincoln. Uh, if those of you that were here last year, um, you can see where he was arrested. They basically took his horse away. It actually wasn't his horse. This is something interesting, too. Back in those days, a horse was like a Porsche 911. It was a luxury. If you were a farmer, you didn't want a horse. You had to feed the thing. It wasn't particularly good eating. In America, we didn't eat the horse. And it didn't pull as hard as, as oxen. If you had to plow, you're better off plowing with oxen. So really, only if you were wealthy did you have a horse. That was not Paul Revere's horse that day. He borrowed it from uh, Deacon, uh, I should know this, it was a Deacon, Larson, I believe it was Larson, okay, I'm not, an, I, this is a little bit improv too, but I believe it was Deacon Larson that Paul borrowed the horse for that famous ride, and uh, 
Anyway, he was arrested in Lincoln, and one of the other writers, Prescott, got through to Concord, and basically, um, and Dan can speak more on this, um, these individual companies of militia like that were met at Lexington, they were just taking their stand on the green. They were there. Uh, they were not there to start a fight. They did not shoot first, as some people contend. Um, but, you know, when, when you face off against another uh, army and you're sitting there like that and you're a little nervous, somebody fires, then all the guys, the young guys, they're, a little, they're, they're pumped up, they're ready to fight, and the fight breaks out and they got mowed down in Lexington. But the militia system, basically you wanted to mass your militias together in an army which happened farther out because the militias, most of them were from farther out and that's what happened in Concord and the towns around it. When they got together and they had their forces together, then they could meet the British uh, with equal numbers and turn them around, which they did. And the turnaround started at the bridge where we're going today. Now, I want to say a little bit more about Paul Revere because when the war was over, we, were, we had a whole lot of pride in this country. God bless you. We had a whole lot of pride. We wanted to do everything for ourselves. We didn't want to be like we were as a colony. So uh, Abigail Adams wrote a cookbook. Uh, another guy, what was his name, decided that British spelled things funny, like color, C-O-L-O-U-R, so we're going to spell it the right way. Who, who wrote the dictionary? No Webster. <laughs> oh, thanks. Thanks, Al. Noah yeah. Webster. Noah Webster, that's right. Noah Webster was also a big proponent of the Constitution, which happened 13 years later. We know the Constitution didn't happen during the Revolution. We had government under the Articles. Government under the Articles of? Before the Constitution, we had the government under the Articles of Con... Very good. Confederation, that's right. So that's what was uh, what was the government was at that time when the, when the fighting broke out. All right. Now, after the war, Paul Revere decides, you know, if if you don't make things, and this is another point that uh, Mr. Wyatt's dad, uh, Brad Senior, I think could speak on very well. If you don't make things as a country, you're still a de facto colony. Because what is what is a colony system? The colony does what? Gives what to the, to the mother country? What does it export? Raw freedom. It exports things that, that are made in the mother country, like raw ma materials. raw materials. That's right. Somebody was saying earlier today the king had a right to uh, any tree that was over like 16 inches wide. That belonged to the king. You couldn't use that. Uh, we exported a lot of things. Um, as when we became a country, we realized that isn't a good idea. It's not a good idea today to have everything made in China, especially if you get in a time of conflict and you need to be making your own things. You know, um, who was it? Uncle Sam that spoke last year said, "When you do things your, for yourself, uh, you're a turkey. You're fly. I mean, you're an eagle, right? If you don't, you're just a turkey and you flutter. You don't fly." So. Revere went to work. Now, what were the three things that were going on that day when he made his famous ride? There were church bells ringing, they were coming for the guns, and um, what else? Well, those two things. We'll start with those. He manufactured church bells, bells afterwards. He started this huge uh, metal company. He manufactured cannon for the Young Republic. He did all the, the metal work of uh, the USS Constitution, which was fought in what war? Do we use those old sailing, those tall ships? Anybody? The Second War of Independence, which was also called the War of? 1812. 1812. We're on the bicentennial of our Second War of Independence. Paul Revere outfitted that, that, that uh, USS Constitution. What was her nickname? Old? Ironside. Ironsides. That's right. Because when that cannonball hit, it actually, it wasn't iron at all. It was very supple kind of oak, and so the cannonballs would kind of bounce off. It, if it was iron, it would have shattered it. Because it would give, it would do that. And the sailors said, huzzah! Her sides are made of iron. They didn't say hurrah back in those days. They said huzzah. Anyway, that's right. So Paul was manufacturing that. And then when we built the Massachusetts State House, the oldest state house in the country, um, a, uh, it, was, it, it was massively bigger than the British State House. We wanted to make a statement that we're our own, uh, call it, we're our own state now. We don't need this old State House where the tyranny was, was the seat of tyranny. And it was a nice big dome, which it still is, but the dome had a problem. It leaked. So you got this great new State House. Everybody's proud of it. You come inside and it's, it's raining inside. <laughs> Paul Revere 
invented the process of pressing copper into sheets. So you ever see like copper, what color does copper turn when it weathers? Anybody know? Green. Green, Green. yeah, it turns, it goes, it's kind of a reddish, uh, shiny color, and then it goes to like a green, and, uh, but that was Paul Revere. He invented that process. And uh, another thing was, what was the thing that the ladies needed to cook with? They needed their own crockery. We're not gonna get that from uh, England anymore. From now on, we're gonna use what? What's it called? Copper. What is it called when Revere made it? No, I always. What kind of what kind of pots and pans are they? What kind? What's the name brand? Okay, I'm Tom. I'm gonna make. I'm gonna have my own co company. I'm gonna make pots and pans. I'm gonna call it Moreware. What's this called? Revereware. Who has any Revereware pots and pans? Anybody? Your your mother or grandmother probably has some Revereware. And if you look at these pans, you know how you know it's Revereware? It says it. What's on the bottom of the pan? The top is like a silver color, but what's on the bottom of the pan? Copper. Yeah, they use it in the process. That's Revereware. And he made it so good that those pans they don't they don't bend. Um, they don't they, they really keep their shape and that they can last forever. That was Paul Revere, the Revereware company. The pioneer of that. He was a great American. Um, you know, he just did everything during his life. He was a great patriot. And um, that's about it. That's about all I have off the cuff for Paul Revere. Does anybody have any questions about this great patriot? Yes. Um, so, Paul Revere, you didn't say the British are coming? No, he said the regulars are out because we were all British at that time. We hadn't declared independence yet. But how come, how come everyone says that he said the British are coming? Um, that that kind of sounds better, maybe? I don't know how that... Yeah, it does sound better. <laughs> the British are coming! Oh wait, we're still British. We haven't declared independence for another year. Yeah. That's probably why they had the, um, when they had that contest for the, um, that's Massachusetts flag or something. Yeah. The, um, Lloyd, he had the stained glass and he made the um, guy's coat red. Yeah. Brown. Absolutely. Mr. Perloff, you were out. You grew up in Lexington, right? That's right. Did, were you ever part of the tradition that the Lexington kids have of staying up on the night of April 18th and watching the reenactment? Yeah. Well, I watched a lot of reenactments, but I didn't stay up all night, though. Oh, no, they, they just stay up till around midnight. That's when they do it. Yeah, that's kind of a fun thing about growing up in Lexington that uh, no other part of the country has. <laughs> All right, I guess that's about it.